Chapter 6 The Glory in the Name After the Cumerians had settled in the Isles of the West, they were known to the rest of the world by another name. The name held no affinity with their racial title by which ancient ethnologists identified them. In many respects, the name was more of a sobriquet, which they appeared willingly to accept. They became referred to as British. Why were they so named? What was so different about the Khmeri or their way of life that actuated other nations to christen them with this strange surname that was ever to identify them before the world, both ancient and modern, even to the subjection of their racial name? Ancient chroniclers leave no doubt that it was the religious beliefs and customs of the Khmerians that set them markedly apart from all other faiths. It was diametrically opposed to all other religions of that time. They believed in one invisible God and the coming of a Messiah. They had no graven images, abhorring the sight of idols. They always worshipped in the open, facing the east. They had a passionate belief in the immortality of life, to such an extent that both friend and foe claimed this belief made them fearless warriors, disdainful of death. Citation, Caesar on the Gauls, Aristotle on the Celts The religious ritual that appeared to make the greatest impression on the foreign historians was their custom of carrying a replica of the Ark of the Covenant before them in all religious observances, as did their forefathers in old Judea. For centuries, as the Khymri passed through foreign lands in migratory waves on their march to the Isles of the West, the chroniclers noted that this custom was never omitted. Citation, C. C. Dobson, The Ark of the Covenant. It was this ritual that gave birth to their British surname. The name British is derived from the ancient Hebrew language, with which the old Kimric language was contemporaneous. Formed from two words, berith, meaning covenant, and ish, meaning a man or a woman. Joined as one word, the meaning is apparent. British means a covenant man or woman. The ancient word Ain, attached to the word Berith, means land. Therefore, the interpretation of the word Britain, as then and still employed, is covenant land. Unknowingly, the ancients named the Keltoi rightly. They were, and still are, the original adherents of the covenant law. With the later adoption of Christianity and the name Christian, a startling new interpretation presented itself. The covenant people became the consecrated people living in the covenant land. This carries the implication that by vicarious atonement, the British were consecrated in the covenant law and initiated to be the advance guard of Christianity, to evangelize the world in the name of Jesus Christ. From a close study of their religious beliefs, everything points to the fact that the Cimmerians held fast to the patriarchal faith of the Old Testament. Many eminent scholars point out the great similarity between the ancient Hebrew patriarchal faith and the Druidic of Britain. Sir Norman Lockyer in Stonehenge and Other British Stone Monuments, page 252, writes, quote, I confess I am amazed at the similarities we have come across, end quote. Edward Davies in Mythology of Rites of the British Druids, preface, page 7, states, I must confess that I have not been the first in representing the Druidical as having had some connection with the patriarchal religion. William Stuckley, in his book A. Berry, preface, page 1, affirms after a close study of the evidence, quote, I plainly discerned the religion professed by the ancient Britons was the same patriarchal faith, end quote. Earlier testimony also affirms, Prosopius of Caesarea, in his History of the Wars, A.D. 530, says, Quote, Jesus Turan, Bel, one only God, all Druids acknowledge one Lord God alone, Digothicus, Book 3. Julius Caesar wrote 54 BC, quote, the Druids make the immortality of the soul the basis of all their teaching, holding it to be the principal incentive and reason for a virtuous life, end quote. Gallic War, Volume 6, page 14. It is a curious fact that the British title was never conferred on their Celtic kinsmen in Gaul, Ireland, and Scotland. Historically, the people of Gaul were even referred to as Gauls, Gallic, and the land known as Gaul, Gallica, and Galatia, until the coming of the Franks. It is believed that the biblical version of the Epistle to the Galatians was addressed to the Gauls of Galatia. Citation, Bishop Lightfoot on Galatians 
the inhabitants of Hibernia, Ireland, and Caledonia, Scotland, retain both their geographical and original racial name. The peoples of what is now England and Wales actually never lost either. The land was always Britain, and the inhabitants were documented as British Celts. The Irish perpetuated the name Celt, but the Scottish, while known to be Celts, were called Gaels. One immediately recognized the similarity between the name Gaul and Gael, Gallic and Gaelic. Incidentally, the Gaels were the original inhabitants of Iberia. After centuries of domicile in Iberia, a large host migrated into Caledonia, Scotland, making way for the constant flow of Celts from the continent to Iberia, or Hibernia, who retained the Irish title. Even though this distinction in names has always persisted, the affinity between them was recognized. The islands were always referred to as the Britannic Isles, even in ancient times, not until the reign of James I, when the Irish and Scottish began to be blended into a central parliament, were the islands known as the British Isles and the United Kingdom. Of later date is the name Great Britain. This may appear confusing to some who more commonly speak of the people of Britain as English and Welsh, and the race as Anglo-Saxon. The national name English was never shared or employed to designate the other inhabitants of the Isles. To this day they retain their Celtic clan title of Welsh, Irish, and Scottish, in spite of the fact that they all shared the title of British citizens. The name Britain continued to name England and Wales long after the arrival of the Anglo-Saxons in A.D. 426. Not until the invading Normans began to be domestically absorbed by the British Celts and Saxons did the Anglican title obtain ascendancy. From the lesser-used name Angle, the national name took form to label the land and its people England. Strange as it may appear on first thought, yet there are no misnomers in the various names and titles. Racially, the Celts, Anglo-Saxons, and Normans were but separate tribal branches of the same Celtic race. This also includes the Danes, who had invaded Britain in A.D. 787. Ethnologically, the whole Celtic race is composed of the Celtic, Saxon, Scandinavian stock. Historically, the arrival of the Danes, Saxons, and Normans are referred to as invasions, but actually it was a converging of the one race into their predestined homeland, which to them and to the world became their motherland, Britain. Together they have grown in stature, wearing the British title like a badge, in honor and with glory. The fact that the British name was singularly identified with the people of England and Wales is more curious than mysterious. As the history of ancient Britain unfolds before us, we can understand the reason more clearly. Irrevocably, they were bound together by the ties of language and religion. Kimrick was their mother tongue, and each practiced the Druidic religion. Britain was the central headquarters of Druidism, to which all paid tithe. It was by far the most populous, and by its commerce and industry was world-renowned. What London is to Great Britain today, Ottawa to Canada, and Washington to the United States, so was Britain to the whole Celtic race. Largely, this was the reason for other nations identifying the British name with England. From the religious point of view, out of which the British name arose, this island was entitled by priority to the title. England was the first of the British Isles to be inhabited. Before the Celts arrived, it was a virgin land, devoid of human habitation. It is claimed that the first settlers arrived circa 3000 BC. Druidism was nationally organized under the capable leadership of Hu Gadarn, circa 1800 BC, the period given for the erection of Stonehenge, which is also ascribed to Hu Gadarn. He was contemporaneous with Abraham. Like Abraham, Hu Gadarn was the chief patriarch of the people known as Who the Mighty. Looking backward over the many centuries, we see the deep significance for this isle being named Britain and its people British. We see destiny motivating these people in their course, a greater will than their own subconsciously directing them to a predestined land where, as Jeremiah had prophesied, they would plant the seed. The climax was reached with the arrival of Joseph of Arimathea and the Bethany group. From then on, the meaning of the word motherland became apparent. England is the only country in history to be naturally known as the motherland. The long centuries had prepared it for Christian destiny. 
From its womb, the Christian cause was born, cradled, and carried to the world. We know that the Celts were by commandment and custom not given to committing anything religious to writing. Neither were they permitted to build altars with the use of metal or nails. They were the true people of the biblical stone kingdom. A traditional custom that indelibly bound the Celts with the old patriarchal faith was the building of altars wherever they rested on their trek to the isles, a religious custom as marked as the carrying of the Ark of the Covenant before them. Today their passage across the world into the isles can be clearly traced by the relics and altars they raised in stone, enduring memorials to their great pilgrimage. This custom outlasted the ritual of the Ark, which was abandoned with the acceptance of Jesus Christ. It lingers today and, as then, only among the Celtic Saxon people. In our times, the custom of erecting these memorials to some great historic event is chiefly practiced by the Scottish and the Canadians. They comprise pyramids of stones piled to a peak and are known as cairns. This is the Celtic name for the word used in the Bible, heaps, stones of witness. The first stone altar in the biblical record was erected by Jacob after his significant dream of the ascending ladder between heaven and earth, known to all Christians as Jacob's ladder. He built it as a witness to contact and covenant with God on that occasion. Ever since the erection of such altars, or cairns, became a religious custom of the wandering Hebrews and Keltoi as they passed through strange lands a declaration and a witness to their belief and faith in the covenant with the one and only invisible God. Despite the evolution of names that identified the people finally named British, the names have always been synonymous with their heritage and religion. The name Kimri originated from King Omri, founder of Samaria, the capital of Israel. The Assyrians called their Israelite captives Beth Omri, Beth Kimri, and people of the Gomri, after their king. The Greeks called them Kimeroi. The Welsh are the only people today retaining the ancient title as the people of Kimri. In the British Museum can be seen the famous black obelisk of Shalmaneser II. This important relic bears reference to the captivity and to all kings subject to the king of Assyria. Amongst these rulers so subject was Jehu, called the son of Omri, king of Israel. The obelisk is a series of twenty small reliefs with long inscriptions. The second relief depicts the son of Omri on his knees, paying tribute in gold and silver in obeisance to the Assyrian ruler. Citation C.F. A Guide to the Babylonian and Assyrian Antiquities British Museum, page 46 In Celtic, the word Kymri is still pronounced with the vowel sign Omri, and easily became Kimri or Kymri, from which Kimari, Kimarians, Keltoi, Celtic, and Kimri have evolved. Crimea, by which that land is still known, is a corruption of Kimri. Vast cemeteries have been disclosed in the Crimea in recent years, producing numerous monuments identifying the Kymri in name, religion, and character with that area where they remained centuries before, marching on. It is interesting to know that the Welsh are the only members of the Celtic race that retained throughout time to the present the original name Kimri. Today it is usually spelled Kymri, C-Y-M-R-I, and their ancient language Kimric. The Welsh have perpetuated their ancient racial characteristics more than any other member of the great Celtic Saxon Scandinavian race. The people of ancient England later became more Saxon in type. This could be due to the vast influx of Angles, Frisians, Jutes, and Saxons that settled in the land following their invasion. Of these, the Angles, or Angles, and Saxons were by far the most numerous. However, each acted according to their native disposition. All of them originated from the northern kingdom of Samaria, where they were first led by Ephraim. It should be remembered that the Ephraimites were the legal inheritors of the title Israel and not Judah or the Jews. In the Bible, the southern kingdom at Jerusalem and the northern kingdom of Samaria are always addressed separately under different names, Judah and Israel. Even God in his instructions refers to them as such. Judah was his sanctuary and Israel his dominion. Psalms 114 verse 2 Consequently, as to be expected, the Ephraimites continued to govern according to the patriarchal law. 
Originally, Judah was part of the priestly sect, with the Levites, the latter being the true dispenser of religious jurisdiction, who were divided between Judah and Israel in service. Among the Celts are the descendants of the priestly group that served Ephraim, or Israel, which is manifested throughout the ages by their deep religious disposition. They also represented the professional class, scientists, doctors, lawyers, etc., which we find so vigorously demonstrated in ancient Britain, in religion, industry, and commerce. The Ephraimites were the true warrior tribe of Israel, the defenders of the faith, as they are today. The Levites were not permitted to bear arms or serve in war, neither were the Druids. Nevertheless, the Keltoi were famed as valiant warriors. This was because there were enough of the warrior Ephraimite clan among them to protect the priesthood and associates in the professions. It has been stated that the major warrior legions of the Ephraimites were the last to leave Samaria, protecting the westward trek of their brethren. This could be true. History shows that even though the Kimri or Kymri were engaged in conflict, during their passage they did not experience one fraction of the combat as fought by the Ephraimites. The question arises, how do we connect the Saxons with the Ephraimites and as brethren of the Celts? It is aptly said that the Bible is the truest history book ever written to which the writer subscribes. Within scripture we find the clues which modern scientists, particularly the detectives of science, the archaeologists, have proved to be real. When Isaac was born, God made a strange statement to Sarah. He said, quote, In all that Sarah hath said unto thee, hearken unto her voice, for in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Genesis 21.12 Nowhere in the Bible record are God's people so known. Theologians either evaded the explanation or were blind to the meaning and to other statements later given by the prophets and by our Lord on the matter. Isaiah and Jeremiah not only strongly emphasized the fact but gave positive clues to their identity. Jesus said he had come to the lost sheep, Ephraim. He told the Jews their inheritance was to be taken away from them and given to another. Jesus could only give such an inheritance to God's own people since from the beginning they were bound within the covenant law to carry out God's purpose on earth through the Christ. His strong commission he gave to St. Paul to go to the Gentiles who would receive him. While St. Paul went to the Gentiles more directly and positively, he went to the people of Britain and ordained the first Christian bishop in Britain in the name of Jesus. Jesus had said that the old law was finished in his sacrifice. He came to fulfill the law, the covenant between God and man. Until the British Druidic Church and its peoples were consecrated in the way, they were as Gentiles, but of all the peoples of the earth, the only existing faith that was prepared beforehand to accept Christ, and the only people to know his name and to speak it before Christ was born, were the British Druids. Christ knew to whom he was addressing himself, St. Paul knew to whom he was specifically directed, as we shall show by historic fact. Joseph of Arimathea, from longer and closer association with Jesus, knew, and to these people both these great apostles went. The Christian elect were to be known in the name of Isaac. Are they so known? Most certainly they are, and the name is Saxon. Equally as the excavated monuments and artifacts from the royal cemeteries of the Crimea have positively identified the Kymri by actual name, so have the ancient historians documented the evolution of the Saxon name from Isaac in their records. Let us check farther back in history. These important facts are necessary to prove God's course and purpose, as later demonstrated by Joseph of Arimathea and St. Paul. The name Semite is derived from Shem, who was the son of Noah, and of whom it is said in Genesis 9.26, Blessed be the Lord, God of Shem. From Shem is descended the special seed elected to be the chosen race. Until the exodus of Abraham from Chaldea, the covenant people were known as Shemites. Under Abraham, they became known as Hebrews. This term derives from Eber, who is a descendant of Shem. The word Hebrew does not specifically designate a race. It means colonist or colonizer, applied in the same manner as it was once associated with the Americans and Canadians. Like the Americans and Canadians, the people were spoken of as colonists. 
exists until they were nationalized. Nationalization of the covenant people was acquired under the dying Jacob, grandson of Abraham and the son of Isaac. Then they became a nation formed of twelve tribes to be so known by the will of God as Israel, meaning ruling with God. Later, when the tribes revolted under Ephraim, the son of Joseph, they became divided into two kingdoms, that of the north and of the south, being known as Judah and Israel. Both went into captivity. A fragment of Judah returned to Jerusalem, but Israel, as Ephraimites, never returned or were ever again mentioned in scriptural history. During this long existence from Shem to the vanishing Ephraimites, the name Jew never occurred in history and was unknown to the Shemites, Hebrews, Israelites, or Ephraimites. Nevertheless, it is true that some of the Jews who later sprang from the remnant of Judah that returned to the holy city after the Babylonian captivity are Shemites or Semites as we now use the name, and they were part of Israel, but only a fragment. In fact, they had become so mixed from intermarriage with other peoples during their captivity, it is doubtful how clear their native claim to Israel could be. However, they are recognized as part of Israel, but only in the same manner as we would say all Pennsylvanians are Americans and all Ontarians are Canadians. But all Americans and Canadians are not Pennsylvanians or Ontarians. Consequently, it is a serious misnomer to consider the Jews of today as the only surviving Semites or Israelites. The major portion of both Judah and Ephraim had long passed out of their original homeland to be known by other names, some of which have already been explained. Now we come to the mysterious promise of God to Sarah. In Isaac shall thy seed be called. Genesis 21:12. The prophets had said they would dwell afar off and be known by another name, one representing their racial heritage. On being questioned by the people whose lands they passed, the Israelites, Ephraimites, and the many of Judah who had joined up with them in their march explained that they were the sons of Isaac. The ethnological chart shows that they divided into two groups, each taking a different route that was ultimately to lead them into the Isles of the West, Britain, the Kymri we have already established, but the warrior Ephraimites became more markedly referred to as sons of Isaac. In writing this name it took on different variations according to language, but the pronunciation was the same, leaving no doubt as to their identity. Ancient documents and monuments refer to them as I Saxons, I Saxuna, Sacasuna, Saxons, and finally Saxons. It is true, historically, they are also known as Scythians, but it must be remembered it was not the name by which the amalgated tribes called themselves, but the name applied to them by the Greeks. For about 700 years they lived in the districts known to the Greeks as Scythia, to the Romans as Dacia, or Dacia, now Romania, and Thrace. Just as the Kymri of Britain assumed the name British, so did the old Ephraimite Israelites elect to be known as Saxons, the name which both concealed and revealed the name of Isaac. The Anglo-Saxons were the chief and most powerful among the associated tribes, hence the accepted leaders. As Saxons, on the invitation of the British chieftain Vortigern, they first entered Britain. After the Saxon settlement in Britain, observers of other nations would have noticed what they might have termed a strange breach of Saxon policy. They began to intermarry with the British Celts. Whether or not the fair blue-eyed Saxons and the darker Celts realized their racial affinity, mutually they blended together. In all their migratory wanderings, the Celtic and Saxon peoples steadfastly refused to intermix or intermarry with the people of other races. To do so was a serious tribal offense recognized by both. In this, they were more loyal to the patriarchal law than were their brethren of Judah during their Babylonian captivity. As prophesied for this overt act, the section of Judah was to be branded by the shoe of their countenance. This is markedly shown, even today, in their descendants by the Hittite cast of black hair and the hooked nose. Not only did they refuse to intermix, they were true to their ancient command to dwell together. History informs us whenever they began their next migratory step, they left few behind, emptying the land. Contrary to the custom of other people who either left behind the aged, the too young, and the infirm, or slew them, the Kymri and the Saxon tribes took all with them. This was more particularly related of the Anglo-Saxons, whose migrations were more numerous and larger spaced in reaching the eventual, quote, homeland, unquote. 
This fact is historically stated in the mass migration of the Saxon peoples into Britain. Dr. Latham writes in his Ethnology of the British Islands, quote, Throughout the whole length and breadth of Germany, there is not one village, hamlet, or family which can show definite signs of descent from the continental ancestors of the Anglo-Saxons of England. Professor Sace writes, All the branches that flowed into Britain are branches of the self-same stock. Not a single pure Saxon is to be found in any village, town, or city of Germany. We once came there, but came out again in our wanderings to these British islands. That they were all kinsmen, Britain, Celt, Gaels, Anglo-Saxons, Jutes, Frisians, Danes, and Normans, is emphasized by Freeman in the Norman Conquest. Quote, it is difficult to realize the fact that our nation which now exists is not really a mixed race in the sense which popular language implies. End quote. Professor Huxley, writing of the political tumult in Ireland in 1870 when agitators tried to make racial difference an issue, wrote, quote, If what I have to say in a manner of science weighs with any man who has political power, I ask him to believe that the arguments about the difference between the Anglo-Saxons and the Celts are a mere sham and delusion. In referring to the characteristic of the Celt, like the Saxon, to, quote, dwell alone, end quote, he states that during the Roman occupation of Britain, Roman and Celt led a separate life from each other, and when the Romans withdrew permanently from Britain A.D. 410, the population was as substantially Celtic as they had found it. In the name of Isaac, the promised seed of God was to be found, as I, Sax, sons, they became Israelites, to be lost, punished for their sin in worshipping the golden calf, scattered throughout the nations, but, quote, like corn winnowed in a sieve, end quote, would finally be gathered together in a place appointed by God himself, 2 Samuel chapter 7 verse 10, where they would settle and move no more, and where no weapon formed against them should prosper, Isaiah chapter 54 verse 17. The validity of these facts cannot be overlooked, nor the other ancient custom among them of keeping the Sabbath. In Exodus 31, we read to whom the command to observe the Sabbath was given, quote, Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations, for a perpetual covenant, verse 16. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever, verse 17, end quote. The Anglo-Saxon race were and are the only people to observe this sign. In the past, when foreigners were questioned as to what impressed them most about English and American customs, they replied, Your English Sunday. While all places were open in foreign lands, in Britain and America the Sabbath was observed. Even at the Great Paris Exhibition, only the British and United States sections were closed on Sunday. Voltaire, the extraordinary intellectual infidel, said, Whether Englishmen know it or not, it is the English Sunday which makes England what England is. This is equally true of America and the British Commonwealth of Nations. Dr. Ryle, Bishop of Liverpool, said, quote, I assert without hesitation that the only countries on the face of the globe in which you will find true observance of the Sabbath are Great Britain, the Commonwealth Nations, and America. No other nations can possibly be said to fulfill this sign. Citation Isaiah 58 verses 13 through 14 However, the warning is sounded in the announcement that when we begin to forsake the Lord's Day, which all Anglo-Saxon people have been doing in various degrees over the years, our prosperity will depart from us. A few years ago, a foreigner visiting England made the remark in the press, quote, You have in England something which we have always longed for and never could attain, Sunday, and you are losing it almost without a protest, end quote. America has always been the greatest desecrator of the Sabbath, more so than the other Anglo-Saxon nations. We all should heed the warning. England derived its name from the Ingles, Angles. The meaning of the name is again significant. Angles means God-men. This name was not conferred upon them because of any special righteousness, but because instead of worshipping idols of stone, as others did, they worshipped God. The idolaters called them God-men, Angles, Angles. The story is told that one day, when Pope Gregory was walking along the streets of Rome, he encountered a group of Roman soldiers with several British, Yorkshire, captive children. He paused in wonderment, enamored by their unusual countenance, golden hair, blue eyes, and fair skin, something he had never seen before. He asked the soldiers who they were. On being told they were Ingles from Ingle Land, 
He remarked on their beauty, replying, They are well named, they look like angels. From this encounter it is claimed Pope Gregory became persuaded of himself to send Augustine to Britain on his mission. The religious habits, customs, and characteristics that so definitely marked the Kymri and the Saxons from the rest of the peoples of the earth cannot be charged to mere coincidences with the ancient patriarchal law. They are too deeply significant. Regardless of how the Celtic Saxon people may have deviated from full adherence to the law in their wanderings, the covenants were the core of their spiritual life, directing their material policies. The covenant meaning name, British, would never have been conferred upon them by other peoples if they had not been more than duly impressed by their religious observances. As one studies the Druidic triads, a greater association with the covenant law is shown with startling clarity. Considering these Hebraic religious customs and the acquisition of interpretive names, one can readily realize how simply and effectively the wedding between the old Druidic religion and the new covenant of the way took place, providing a fertile field and a safe sanctuary for Joseph of Arimathea and his companions. This was not an accident. It was the beginning of the new destiny long before prophesied, which was brought to birth in the great sacrifice of Jesus Christ, our Savior. There are still people who insist that the British story is a superstitious myth without foundation, just as they continue to debate that the Bible is untrue. They are as mentally fog-bound as the Victorian historians who could not understand how, why, or where there could be any connection between the ancient British and the continental races, and less with the prophecies and people of the Bible. Unfortunately, at that time, the historic past was not so well revealed to them as archaeology has disclosed it in modern times, even as the amazing discoveries in the caves of the Dead Sea during the years 1955 through 56 have brought to the light of day thousands of stored documents secreted therein by the Essenes, substantiating the books of the Bible in every instance. Equally so, during the last 25 years, archaeologists have supplied the modern ethnologist and historian with indisputable evidence to vindicate the historic age-old story of the people of Britain. The Essenes were the most cultured and learned religious order existing before the birth of Christ, free of the contamination of power politics or orthodox religion. They were the greatest truth-seekers of their time. Most of the discovered documents were written before Christ and much after his advent. Every day translators are disclosing material that has long puzzled theologians concerning both the Old and New Testaments. Much of this testimony proves the historic validity of the facts given herein. Archaeologists unearthing monuments, tablets, coins, and various other artifacts name and trace the covenant peoples of our story from their ancient birthplace to the Isles of the West and the British and Americans to their place in modern history. Crushed beyond revival are the diatribes of the atheists and the mocking voices of the higher critics of Germany. Authority has been stripped from the irresponsible historians. It is not so well known that H. G. Wells' outline of history that sold by the million copies was most severely criticized by an angry group of scientists and scholars who dubbed Wells' work as, quote, a gross mass of medieval historic error, unquote. Wells was obliged to abridge the next edition. Although he corrected a number of his flagrant errors, he was unable to make a complete correction without rewriting the whole work, which he did not do. The devil is ever alert to use the infidel mind and careless writers to divert all whom he can from the truth. In the end, truth always wins. There is ever a fascination to be found in a name. It seldom fails to intrigue the mind creating a curious desire to learn what it may mean and how it was derived. In names as shown herein, invariably is found the key that unlocks the door to an age-old mystery. No names can equal the drama of Kymri, Saxon, and the British, and of them all, the name British is the most enthralling name in all history. Oh.